next on Startup. We're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to meet with the Gouda girls, who went from their careers of owning a daycare and driving a semi to chasing their dream of starting a grilled cheese food truck. Then we're gonna head to Detroit to talk to the owners of McClure's Pickles, who built a global business from an old family recipe. And last, we're going to Pittsburgh to meet with the creators of House of the Dead and find out why these guys left their jobs to create America's first and only zombie store. All of this and more is next on Startup. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail, so I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm parked on the corner of Euclid and Howell in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we're going to talk to the Gouda girls, Catherine and Tina, who found a new passion in life in the form of a food truck. Now, hard work is nothing new to Catherine and Tina, but we're going to find out what took this amazing food truck and made them the big cheese of Wisconsin. Mobile food trucks have been around for years, and their resurgence was fueled by a number of post-recessionary factors, including the closing of many construction sites where lunch trucks with fast and affordable food could be found. This led to a surplus in the number of available food trucks and created a huge market for gourmet mobile cuisine across major American cities. Although owning and operating a food truck can be extremely challenging, Catherine and Tina Tan saw an opportunity to change the course of their lives, and they haven't looked back since. Hello, I'm Catherine Tan, and I'm a partner with Tina Tan here. We're here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, serving curbside comfort to those who want to come out and have a grilled cheese sandwich. We are doing the Gouda Girls mobile food truck. Okay, so you said you're eating grilled cheese. You know that's an award-winning grilled cheese you're eating? I had no idea, but uh, I, can, I can only imagine. I, I know there's several types of cheeses in there. Right. Um, nice buttery kind of uh, okay. on the outside of the bread. It reminds me a little bit about uh, how mom used to make them when I was a kid. Right. Awesome. Yeah. What led you to be a Gouda girl? Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. I don't know if we have quite that much time, but I'll try to condense it down okay. for you. My dad was a fabulous cook. No professional cooking experience, but yeah. he did all the cooking. My mother was from Copenhagen, Denmark, never cooked. He taught me so many different things, but I always had this underlying urge to drive over the road semi. I drove dump truck for 12 years out of Appleton, okay. and that's when I met Catherine. Catherine's health started going south, and her doctor, our doctor said, you need to find something else to do with your life because this stress is gonna kill you. And I said, you know, I said, we should go buy a food truck. And she goes, oh my God, we should. <laughs> totally did not mean it. it. Seems like both of you were pretty developed in your careers. How, how did you really acquire the financing to start this new venture? And, and tell me about that time period. Was it scary? Was it, I mean, <laughs> get, really is. take, take me, <laughs> yeah. Right. Take, uh -huh. take me back to that to that moment where he decided to jump off the cliff like a couple lemmings here into the truck. At that point, there was only three food trucks in Milwaukee. And we went up and we started talking to them. And, and we tried to be smart. We watched. We watched. Yeah. We came down every Friday for a month and saw how many customers did they get? What was their medium price? This was what before you even bought the truck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you did market research. Yeah. yeah. Mobile food trucks are a $1 billion industry that has seen an 8.4% growth rate from 2007 to 2012. Hey, sorry guys, I had to take a quick break and grab a sandwich. 
All right, so I think that where we left off, um, we were talking about business, and you were talking about the, the organization here in town that helped you out with the microloan on some of your equipment that you could buy. So since that, uh, the rest of it you paid for out of your savings and your checking, correct? Yes. What about the truck? Tell me about the purchase of the truck. We found it on, on eBay. Catherine said, that's my truck. That's the truck I want to buy. Right. And ironically enough, just as she said it, somebody put a bid in on the truck. Oh no. And she goes, well look, see if there's a phone number. If there's a phone number, I'm gonna call. So she called the, the number. He goes, I can I can hear it in your voice. He goes, that's your truck. And he goes, I'm, I'm gonna take it off of eBay. That's, and. You guys cheated at eBay. We did. <laughs> Score one for us, hello. <laughs> Buy it now. That's right. Buy it now. That's right. Oh, so, that um, so between what Catherine had in savings and I had a 401k mm -hmm. where I worked, and of course with the market continuously going down, I just cashed it out. So between the money that she had and the money I had saved, mm -hmm. that's how we got this whole thing started. The one thing with our business, it's, it's largely run by social media. When, when we get a, a tweet or a comment on our Facebook fan page about our truck, mm -hmm. it actually is just... They're the nice ones. And damn, that was a good cheesesteak sandwich. <laughs> it's that where, oh my God, I haven't had that since my mom made it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that knowing that you touch them simply by cooking. Mm -hmm. I mean, that a lot of people take for granted. That it's like, you know, well, you just cook. But you bring back memories. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's quite heartfelt. You know, we're very rich in heritage back here in Wisconsin, and especially in Milwaukee. Our families are very strong in their recipes that they share, and we've mm -hmm. got some really good things going on, of course, being the dairy industry here. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mom, cheese, dairy, come on, comfort foods. Yeah. What's a better fit? People will say, I need something gluten free, or could I please get something vegan, or could I get, would you try this recipe that my mom gave me? She's been gone for 10 years, but I bet yeah. you could cook it. You know, and that's a challenge to me. I'd say, bring your recipes, baby, I'll try it for you. You know, so now we have our own homemade barbecue sauces or our home, that people have brought in that we now offer on the truck because they're personal and they're good. And now we've got someone special, a connection somewhere with one of our clients. So that's what makes it fun. It keeps it, like you said, fresh. With somebody else that has this dream, that has this vision, that wants to do something, maybe they're unemployed, underemployed, or just not happy with what they're doing in their life. What advice could you give to them, being that you've, you're living it, you're living proof? Don't be afraid. Yeah. Just do it. Just do it. You know, the food truck industry's down in the wintertime. Our sales were more limited, and it got a little scary. You gotta take that chance. You gotta take a chance. And so we're just gonna keep feeding the people and paying our bills and yep. get up every day and just and keep going. Can, and can honestly say doing exactly what we love to do. Now, For sure. Charlie, Maybe the sun can help you. Do it. I'd like you to teach him how to make a cheese stick. So just grab one one piece, squirt a little bit on the grill. Yeah. No, on the on the meat itself. Smack it on the grill. Okay. And I get the other side. Nope, just one side. Okay. There we go. Okay. And I'm chopping it. Yep. Like that. I'm trying to bring ah, it. Ah, pulling it. Cool. There you are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Take, put our two it's not pretty, but I have a feeling it's going to taste good. You guys have God, been There's a reason why we do this. Oh, Thank, so Thank, Thank you, dear. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Us. Takes a lot more than buttered cheese and bread to win the Best Grilled Cheese Award two years in a row in Wisconsin. And these two ladies have set an example for business people everywhere that it's not about what you get, but about what you give that makes you truly successful both in life and in business. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for the Gouda Girls. I'm on Russell Street in Detroit's Eastern Market, and this is where it all started for McClure's. From their grandmother's kitchen to global sales, McClure's is fast becoming a household name in pickles, Bloody Mary mix, and potato chips. Let's go find out how they took this family recipe and turned it into a family business. The food product market is extremely competitive, and there's an overwhelming volume of new products being submitted to American markets each month. 
Things like sustainability, price point, and a relatable story have become increasingly important for a new product's success. Joe and Bob McClure did their due diligence, spent time researching the market, and grew at a manageable pace. They made an educated decision to set aside their careers and chase their dream of making world-class pickles. It's just a statement. Uh, hopefully you never had a pickle that tastes like ours. Uh, I don't know. I would never have a mission statement. Uh, my name is Joe McClure. I'm with McClure's Pickles. And hopefully uh, this is the best pickle you've ever had and you won't go to another pickle after trying ours. I've been eating McClure's Pickles for a while now. And it's kind of a dream of mine to be able to pack a jar myself and know that, that I put my stamp on that and it went on the shelf. Can you teach me? Absolutely. Let's get geared up. So, uh, we're, so we're cleaning jars down at one end, and we're, uh, we're filling them with uh, garlic, dill, and hot peppers. We're doing a spicy bash today. OK. One, one pepper. There we go, five. I like a lot of garlic, so I'm going to throw five in there. Okay. And uh, you have most, most people uh, packing pickles, since that's, like, that's the kind of the bottleneck in our operation, is how fast you can pack these pickles, right? So do you pack as many as will fit? What a beautiful jar. You're hired. <laughs> And then you have two guys down at the end uh, filling and capping them. Ooh, that is, that is pungent, man. That is some strong stuff. I think the, the production would slow down if I was doing this right now, wouldn't it? It's just a nice, nice and snug. snug, and that's it. Everything is being hand shuffled right now, so there aren't a lot of conveyors that are moving and filling and capping. Like I said, it's simple, but sometimes simple is the best answer, you know? Your first real batch, thinking back at your first batch, how did that come about? Yeah, the first batch, uh, I mean, a lot of it was self-funded. We didn't have a whole lot of funding. To build this place out, we took a $50,000 loan out uh, against my parents' home. Joe had alluded to the fact that you guys refied your house and gave them 50 grand to start? Yes, yes. We told them that if they didn't succeed, we would move in with them for the rest of their lives, and that would be their punishment. <laughs> so it worked awesome. that way, yes. It's actually my great-grandmother, my grandmother's recipe, the boy's great-grandmother. What, was that always something that you just enjoyed? Were you forced to do it? Like, how, how did this come about? We were kind of forced to do it. Uh, okay. It was, uh, you know, it was just something uh, that we grew up doing every August. We had to go down to the market. My grandpa and my father woke us up real early. We just, we spent the whole day in the kitchen. Uh, just one day, uh, typically one day in the summer. Uh, and we did it every year. Every family almost has something like that, you know, whether yeah. it's a, a pickle recipe like ours or uh, sweet potatoes or biscuits or something like that. Someone's got something that they do with their family every year. Ours just happen to be pickles and we just happen to take it to a business. Well, they brought it to us and said, we want you to help us start a company. They said, will you finance us and work for us for free? And we kind of looked at them and said, well, we believe What a in great deal. Yes, we believe in you guys. We know what you can do. We know you can succeed. So we did. This is essentially our warehouse. This is where finished goods are. Okay. Um, so we'll have uh, all our finished uh, packed up pickles, Bloody Mary mix, uh, potato chips as well, which cool. we co-pack here with Better Made. These are responsible for the last 10 pounds I gained, yeah, by the way. Nice. So uh, this, is, this is always in a flux. Uh, most of this product will be all gone by today. Uh, this will be all, all sent out of here. Will be gone by yep. There has been a dramatic uptick in the demand for fresh, organic food. Since 1990, the growth of the U.S. organics industry has exploded in revenue from $1 billion to $26.7 billion. We were always selling pickles uh, at the farmer's markets, and we sampled uh, tomato juice mixed with the pickle brine. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you have a, a pickle brine Bloody Mary mix, right? Yep. Um, so people kept coming, coming around and saying, well, why don't you guys just bottle that? Uh, we said, all right, that's what we'll do. So we started bottling it, and it's one of our best sellers now. Mm -hmm. This also branched us out into a whole other industry, though, the liquor industry. So now we're teaming up with tequila companies, vodka companies, you gin can companies. Selling the bars? And selling everything. the bars, restaurants, uh, wow. even just your corner liquor store. How much product are you going through? Cucumbers, dill, garlic, all of that, roughly? About 40, uh, 40 crates, which is a bushel and ninth, and there's about two to 300 cucumbers per bushel so you're looking at uh, eight nine thousand yeah eight to ten thousand cucumbers a day yeah how how far did that first run of of capital get you on your feet and in, in a business yeah yeah it got us here we haven't taken out any more until we started moving into this place wow yeah so this is our new um this is our new pickle production plant uh, okay. we're moving out of that place that you saw earlier and moving into this place it used to be an old american axle plant where they used to uh strip down the cars uh, pull them apart calibrate them uh, okay. and then send them off. And now it's going to be a pickle, uh, pickle production facility. Wow. 
At what point should a business expand? And at what point did you decide to expand? Yeah, I can't store anything more. I can't, right. I couldn't even add another kettle. I'm, I'm, pulling, I'm pulling every bit of electrical juice that I can possibly pull unless I put a whole other transformer outside. So flat out, are you guys profitable yet? Yeah, we're profitable. Yep. Okay. Uh, first couple years we weren't, and then we started turning a profit in our third year. Third um, year. A small profit, but then you know, gradually grew year after year. So if you had a business philosophy uh, what would it be for McClure's Pickles? So the ultimate philosophy is you have to stand behind your products. You know, everything you make, um, you got to believe in yourself, and then hopefully other people will believe in it as well. It's clear after talking to Joe that taking out another loan to grow the operation is simply a necessary risk. I checked in with him a few months later, and after they settled into their 25,000 square foot space, I was amazed at what I'd found. The additional space provided rooms for automation, more rooms for cucumbers, jars and ingredients, and room to hire additional employees. Indeed, their gamble to triple their operating space did pay off. Within weeks of the expansion, they received their first order from retail giant Whole Foods, and they begun to fill orders for restaurants looking to carry the McClure's line, an unanticipated additional revenue stream. I mean, you, you take it step by step, you know. Uh, um, it wasn't overnight. Um, case by case, uh, order by order. You know, we, we wanted a, a long path, a long road of sustained growth, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Cool. Well, thanks again for bringing us back. From the kitchen table to this, a full-blown warehouse in downtown Detroit, the McClure brothers really know what they're doing when it comes to pickles and business. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for McClure's Pickles. I'm on Butler Street in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we're gonna go talk to Chuck and Stu, who created House of the Dead. Now, these are just a couple of ordinary guys who love horror films, but how are you supposed to turn that into a business? We're gonna find out how they brought this unique concept to life and have put themselves at the center of the zombie capital of the world. The zombie genre has evolved from a cult following to a billion dollar industry. From local zombie walks to the run for your lives, 5K obstacle course, DVD sales, video games, comic books, and conventions. Zombies seem to be after your checkbook more than anything else these days. Chuck and Stu knew that this store could work with the right business plan, and they were able to create a sales model that earned the confidence of their loan officer and turned this store into an overnight success. I'm Stu. And I'm Chuck. And we're here at House of the Dead in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And our mission statement is, we're the only two guys in the world that hope for the zombie apocalypse. So, so guys, tell me where we are right now. What is this place? We're in the House of the Dead in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, we are a everything a zombie store. Uh, we sell everything from t-shirts, posters, DVDs, to uh, original art. Almost all, everything is zombie themed. I've always been into horror uh, okay. since I was, you know, I've basically been raised on, on B-movie, horror, <laughs> flicks, um, right. slasher, anything. Um, uh, there's probably a lot of uh, psychoanalysis that's going to have to take place a long time <laughs> from now. But my mother and I have worked things out. I just got a real affinity for these cheap, low-budget horror movies. And then once you found out that a lot of these movies were made here in Pittsburgh, that made it even that much more cool. Right. Let's celebrate it. Let's have a place where fans from all over the world, from all over the country can come and, and sort of just get their zombie on. I, I always find the, uh, the most interesting topic of debate is the, uh, you know, what, is, what makes a zombie? So you have your, uh, your fast-moving zombies, your virally infected zombies or induced yeah. zombies, or whether that was caused by a curse, or uh, you know if it just eats the brains versus if it's flesh-eating. I mean, we've debated this for hours and hours <laughs> over many, many beers as to whether things like, is a mummy a zombie? Is Frankenstein a zombie? If they were dead and came back, is that the true definition of zombie? Yes. 24-7 Wall Street estimates the zombie economy to be at $5.74 billion. George Romero's Night of the Living Dead was made for $114,000 and grossed $18 million internationally. I actually kind of wandered in. I was uh, going to use the trash receptacle on the corner, I'm not going to lie. Okay. And I saw the name of the store, said sound pretty cool, walked in, and it totally piqued my curiosity. Bowling Zombies. 
great for playing at home or on vacation. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was a cool store. I want to get some t-shirts. Um, I would like to buy the um, teddy bears, but next time. Take me back to that night. You guys, are, from my understanding, you're hanging out and, and you're having a few uh, pops. And you start talking about what? The Walking Dead. We were watching Walking Dead while this was okay. going on. Yes. And one of us just looked at the other one and said, you know, we should open a zombie store. <laughs> and the other one's response. I can tell you how many times I've said that. <laughs> and then the other one's response was, yeah, we should. <laughs> and then most ideas just die right there. One of us called the other one up the next day and said, were you serious about that zombie store thing? Well, yeah, if you were. We said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll draw up a business plan awesome. just for laughs and we'll take it down to the bank and they're gonna laugh yeah. us out of there, but at least we gave it a shot. I don't know whether someone was looking out for us or it was just kismet. The loan officer they gave us at the bank happened to be a horror movie fan. <laughs> and Huge zombie fan. read over the business really? plan and said, here's money, go do it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> There was enough to cover us buying merchandise, okay. uh, paying a couple of months rent, and getting the fixtures. So you didn't want to overborrow? No. Having done this before, I knew you never want to overextend yourself. Right. Go for as little as possible, mm -hmm. and there's always more there if you need it later on. But if you use up everything they give you and things start off slow, or things don't go as expected, yeah you have nothing to fall back on. So walk me through those steps in the business plan. What, what were you thinking? You had to have money. You had to define who your market was. You had to make sure that you had enough, I guess, ability to sustain a business, to sustain your lives, right? Sure. So, so walk me through that. What could we do to generate enough sales to cover our expenses every month? Okay, so you, back, you kind of reversed engineered it. Yes. This is the number we need. How do we get there? How do we make, say, $1,000 a month to pay the rent, the utilities, cover the bank loan. Yep. What, what are we going to have to sell to make that? And we knew that our number one selling thing was going to be t-shirts. Absolutely. So we looked at how much do t-shirts cost? What are we going to have to sell them for? How many are we going to have to sell every day for an entire month if we sold nothing else to pay that, to make that nut? Yeah. In the beginning, it was, I think we had to sell five t-shirts a day. That's manageable. Yes. <laughs> Very manageable. And that's what, I, that's what I think the loan officer looked at. He said, I can't see why they couldn't sell five t-shirts so, a day. I wish these guys a lot of luck. I think it's a neat concept. I learned a lot today about zombies. I didn't know that zombies originated in, the, in Pittsburgh, right? Right. Zombie capital of the world. This store wouldn't exist without social media. Okay. So we were able to get a mailing list. We were able to start a Facebook following to where we now have close to 2,000 followers on Facebook. And in wow. this day and age, you can now let 2,000 people know about something going on in the store instantly. Yeah. What advice would you give to somebody who, who has, the same, has the same kind of idea in their head? As a zombie store, I would say no. Not, really. <laughs> not a zombie store. Especially in Pittsburgh. Right. This model translates to anything. Sure. If I have an idea I'm passionate about, but I believe somewhere in my gut it might work and it haunts me at night that I'm not doing it. Be so realistic. what do you say? Be, Be realistic. realistic. Don't over imagine that you're gonna make a million dollars the first week, that be realistic as to how long it's going to take and be prepared to put in a lot of work. Awesome, well thanks a lot for talking right, with me Thanks today, so much guys, Barry. I appreciate Barry, it. Thank it's you so great much. to meet you. So when you have an idea that just keeps eating away at your brains, like Stu said, you gotta just strip all the dead weight from your business plan and make sure no one tries to kill your dream. Now. These guys might be into zombies, but this business is alive and well in Pittsburgh. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for House of the Dead. I'm Angie Hicks, founder of Angie's List. If you're gonna go out and launch a small business, you know, have a good idea, be patient with it but stay focused. I think sometimes people get so distracted by how, what their business could be that they tackle too many things at once and you know, the distraction can lead to failure. I think perseverance is really a big, you know, big part of it. Also, when you're overcoming obstacles, it's really about being able to step back and not getting overwhelmed by what the problem is. I mean, I'm a firm believer that you know, only by failing do you learn. You, know, you need to make mistakes because that's how you can improve. 
Uh, but it's really how you handle that is really what makes the difference between, you know, I think companies that fail and companies that succeed is, you know, how do you learn from it? How quickly can you respond to make sure you steer correctly? Next time on Startup, we're going to Chicago, Illinois to meet with John, who created Chicago Pizza Tours, a business that's taken a bite out of Chicago. Then we're going to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to meet with Lori and Mary Beth, who started the new hip youth clothing line, Yo Bro, apparel for little dudes. And last, we're going to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to meet with Tim, the seasoned contractor who built the Iron Horse Hotel. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. What what uh what do you call organic food? What did they call organic food in 1950? No idea. Food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. American Express is proud to support startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online.